All right, we'll start for the industry session. Uh, we'll have seven speakers from four companies, representing four companies. So Quantinium first, um, then Quandela, uh, then Huawei, and to finish, Hashberg. So uh, we start with Quantinium. Uh, Bob will, so Bob, chief scientist at Quantinium, will start. And then will be um, Ross, uh, oh, Matty, second, uh, researcher in cryptography. And Ross, uh, head of software development at Continuum. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So, so, so I'll, I'll, my talk will be in two parts. The first part will be a general thing about the company, very short, five minutes, and then, then, then a bit specifically of what we actually are doing here in Oxford uh, as part of Continuum. Uh, uh, okay, so first of all about myself. As some may have known, I used to be a professor at Oxford here for a very long time. Now this dude running from the stairs kind of took over there. Uh, so I moved away. Uh, and then I became chief scientist and was called Cambridge Quantum. By the way, the name had already changed once by then since I joined because it used to be Cambridge Quantum Computing. So, okay. so it became Cambridge Quantum. And okay, that's not true anymore in either sort of. Although I'm sure Ross probably still uses it on his slides. Uh, so now I'm chief scientist at Quantinium. So what is Quantinium? Because people are very confused about it. So Quantinium is the merger of part of Honeywell, part of Honeywell. So it's not Honeywell who took over uh, Cambridge Quantum or anything like that. Like a part of Honeywell, the quantum part of Honeywell split off. And that merged with us to form Quantinium. That's what happened. It's not completely independent of, from Honeywell because Honeywell is still one of the main shareholders in Quantinium. And the CEO of Honeywell is also the chairman of Quantinium. So they're still very much intertwined. It, al it also doesn't mean that, that, that we only sort of interact with Honeywell because also IBM is a main shareholder. So we also are very nice and friends with IBM and we are very, very friends with all the other companies too. So that maybe not with one or two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Continuum Teams, I'll give an overview on the teams we have. So in Cambridge there is Quantum Software, and if I'm correct that still includes Quantum Chemistry, and uh, that's headed by Ross. Then in Oxford that's Quantum NLP, to keep it simple, and Compositional Intelligence more general, and that's headed by me. Uh, so I got sort of two roles, so overall scientist and well, we see the roles later. Then we got London One, that's Quantum Crypto and that includes Matty. Includes Matty, who actually still is in Oxford, in the office next to me, because he's the only one who can stand my music in the world. Uh, then uh, London Two, that's Quantum Machine Learning and Optimization. Then Colorado, that's Iron Trap Quantum Hardware, that's the bit which actually split off from, uh, I, mean, I mean, these are restricted descriptions. There is a little bit more going on in all of them, but the, so this is like the, the main activity. And then there is Tokyo, where they're doing a little bit of everything. They're kind of sort of more a window to Asia of all the rest. And then Munich, that's currently being set up. So th the exact shape isn't being, and there's even a, a Paris office currently being set up. Okay, that's misspelled, sorry. <laughs> hey, that's actually a nice one, by the way. Okay, so some people, so our CEO is Ilyas Khan, he's like a CEO and philanthrope. For example, people know the journal Quantum and Compositionality, they are all being funded by him, and a lot of other stuff has been funded by him. So there's me, I'm the chief scientist, there's Ross, who's the head of software, Stephen Clark, who, people who know DiscoCat, who was like one of the three people on the first paper, is the head of AI, uh, Kwang Long Wan is the ZX research lead, and then Thomas, who's introducing us, He's, so, he's an evangelist, but not in the religious, the religious sense. I didn't know what the, if a word evangelist meant until I had to hire him. So he's basically sort of uh, making us look good, but he also takes under himself, like making the ex, uh, pro promoting the ex to the out outside world, QPL, other conferences like ACT and all that stuff. So that's Thomas. Talk to Thomas and you learn. Uh, that's the Oxford team. This. A year and a half ago, we were four people at 20%. So a, this has grown a lot, a lot. 
Uh, this is more or less, so let, so let me mention some other team people there. So the third person is Dimitri Kartsaklis, locally in Oxford. He's the head of software. Then there's Konstantinos, who's running around here, locally in Oxford. He's the head of implementation. Destiny, everybody knows. Destiny used to be with me in Oxford. Now Destiny is full-time at Continuum and so on. So there's a bunch of other faces you probably know. Um, right, so let me go to the story now. The, this, this story kind of starts in 2005 when I uh, wrote this paper, Kindergarten Quantum Mechanics. Of course, this was a big lie. This wasn't for kindergarten, but you, you found some paper, uh, pictures in there like that, and that was sort of a kind of cute. Then you fast forward 13 years, and then you get this book, which Alex and I wrote, uh, Picture in Quantum Processes. And that sort of was the realization of turning quantum mechanics internally, entirely into diagrams, which was initially the plan with the kindergarten quantum mechanics. The plan there really was, can we turn quantum mechanics entirely in diagrams? So we did this here, uh, five years later. Uh, new book forthcoming in September with Stefano, one of the organizers here. Uh, uh, so, so this is actually much closer to kindergarten quantum mechanics. This is at least sort of teenager quantum mechanics. So that's, that's a big step forward. It's a lot thinner than the, than the, than the big book, and it's going to be published by Quantinium. So we're not going via one of these whatever useless uh, publishers there are. So ever, and the sort of treatment we are getting. How is the treatment, Stefano? Are you here? Yeah. How are we treated? Yeah, okay, indeed. So we, we're, ba we're, basically involved, we're basically involved in every little single detail of, of how the thing is coming together. I mean, look at that, that's great. Yeah, yeah, of course. Huh? Yeah. I'm going to personally curate that version. Anyway, so at the same time, again, um, uh, th that's in my office, by the way, my new office. We're, we're lecturing all the, this entire book in terms of lectures with a lot of different people involved, like Alex is involved, Matty is involved, like a bunch of people in Oxford are involved in that. Uh, so everybody, and then they will be broadcast. And they're really funny because I was the sort of, I was, how do you call it? I was the director, so they're a little bit outrageous. Uh, okay, so, so I mean, I'm going to go quickly through that. M most people know it. But so this, this, is a, this is a part of what we do in Oxford. This, this is for us a, a part of the company, you know. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it looks a little bit different. So the story is always about wires and boxes, but we, we, we actually sort of went to a paradigm where particles travel through wires, because I think it's easier for children to understand and the sort of systems and process stuff. Okay, and so but we still have boxes and wires, like everybody knows, you put them together, you got cups and caps, and then you can slide, and then you get teleportation. If you've been here this week and you still don't know everything, then well, I don't know what you've been doing, but okay. Uh, okay, you know this big thing. So, I don't, so a wire, a, a, a wire has two endpoints, which is very limited because if you compose two wires together, you get a Gannon wire. So it's something very boring, and that's really that I don't think I've heard anybody, anybody say this week. That's really why you got spiders, because if you compose spiders, you get again a spider, but not necessarily the same spider. So you can get all kinds of different spiders, and that's like a really neat idea. And then. You got two different kinds of spiders, and if they fight, then there are they boom, boom, and then their arms fall off because the other spider bites oh, oh, and pulls out the. You know, it's easy to pull out the arms of a spider. Um, okay. Anyway, and then you use spiders for circuit optimization. Like here, you got three C not gates. Uh, okay, they fuse using your rules. Boom, boom, and you got circuit optimization. So a really cool thing is that. When we wrote the big book, circuit optimization wasn't really done by anybody. In the new one, we use actually, there are, for the kids, there's actually techniques which didn't exist at the time of the big one. So it's, it's, it's in a way more advanced, which is kind of cool. Anyway, so, as I, so why is the X calculus so powerful? Like everybody knows, also meanwhile, there was a, a series of people who contributed to proving completeness so that any equation can be derived in it. Uh, okay, so. The X calculus actually started in 2007 with a paper by Ross and I. So this was the first one. It's not really like sort of published anywhere because this is what the referee said. Uh, where this is leaded. Oh, sorry, phone. Where this is leaders. Uh, important results have not occurred in the present paper. 
And so that was a sort of stuff we got, so it got rejected, like systematically rejected everywhere. So these are the companies now which are using quantum picturalism. The ones I know of, the ones I know of, sorry. So it, it, it's, so every, every few days there's a couple of more which are coming on this list. So these are the people who are now using all of that for quite important thing. Yesterday again a paper came out from Google, you can see this on Twitter. Uh, the, 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 there was a lot of propaganda about, about it, how important the X is for like uh, lattice surgery and stuff like that. Anyway, so these are the companies now using all that stuff. You get my point? Okay, back in 2005, I gave a talk about teleportation at McGill. Jim Lambic was in the audience. Uh, Lambic said, Bob, this is grammar. So what we actually were trying to come up with, like for describing quantum mechanics, suddenly got interpreted by Bob, this is grammar. Uh, I mean, you know, three years later, there was like the Mernouche and Steve Clark uh, thing of like combining meaning and grammar. So I'm going very fast here, which uh, we saw recent. Uh, well, okay. Okay, we saw, we saw people who were in the demo. So for example, uh, Lambic is the practical realization of this. This is the software tool which this do does this plus something else, plus the fact that since we use the quantum model for language, you better stick it on a quantum computer too, right? And that's what Lambic does too. Now, okay, by the way, now you know why Lambic was called Lambic, right? This is Jim Lambic. Okay, so a few years later with Will Zeng, who was a former student of me, who's now the head, then, had, then went to Rigetti, now is the head of Goldman Sachs Quantum. Uh, so we considered the idea of really sticking this language model on the quantum computer and we saw that it was really easy to get some quantum advantage speed in terms of speed up. Uh, then we just did it with four of us. Uh, th this is when we were 20% at Quantinium, all of us. Uh, Cambridge Quantum com uh, Computing, sorry. <laughs> was it that? Uh, then we did it bigger with a few other people. And now you can just do it like you just saw in the demo this afternoon because we released we released Lambeck uh, this gave us a few uh, Forbes covers so it was considered important and it's actually considered by the quantum commuting compu community as a very important new avenue for like a quantum technology anyway so the way it goes we've seen this you got Alice and Bob, uh, you got uh, the states, the states which are representing meanings, the wires represent grammar. You put them together, you get an algorithm to compute, compute the meaning of a sentence from the meaning of the words. That's really what it is. So now we start deforming this, we start deforming this, and you get something that looks like this using some spiders. You stick, you pull some spiders out using the X, uh, you deform it a bit, and you get a parameterized quantum circuit. That, that's really what Lombeck does. It gives you it turns it turns language in a parameterized quantum circuit like you see here. Then you do some uh, then you do some machine learning, and basically that's what we did. Now the last thing I want to say is, uh, so of course there, there there was a lot of new theory at the basis of this. There was the new theory uh, of quant categorical quantum mechanics, like formulating quantum physics in terms of composition or tensor or picture or whatever you call it. There was this way of combining meaning and grammar in a general way or more linguistic structure. And, and some of the things we do now is basically inventing new theories of language. And I'm going to give you, as the last thing I'm going to say, uh, one of the last things I've been working on. So I had a paper a while back, which, which was the mathematics of text structure, which was really, so typical grammar formalisms just are, typic, uh, are just about uh, sentences, like you got grammar for, uh, for your words and they tell you when you put these words together, when do you actually get a valid sentence. So what about text? So what you already saw here, these first steps, they were already something where you take usual grammar and you turn it into something that you can actually compose, something more circuit-like. And we actually tried to do this for all of English initially. So we started with, so this is with these two, one PhD student now, former MMC student who I hire. I just hire everybody who's good now. Uh, uh, so basically this is the representation of the grammar of a sentence. It's a bit more than Chomsky trees. You also got some sort of pronoun resolution and stuff like that. Doesn't matter whether you understand that, but this is some sort of hybrid formalism of grammar. Sober Alice who sees 
drunk Bob clumsily dance laughs at him. Okay, and then we start to do some topology on that. So first we kind of like bring these pronoun resolutions into the picture in some way. We, 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 we add some uh, formal wires. Then we start to say bye bye one dimension. We go into two dimension. Then we introduce some boxes instead of like these notes. We go on and we end up with a circuit. So this is an algorithm. This is not something just for this example. This wor works for all of English. So we got an algorithm which turns normal language with grammar into circuits. And just to, this, this is not what I'm going to talk about. It's not out yet. But what's very beautiful about this thing is if you start with two different languages, you get the same circuit. So these circuits are language independent. So we erase a bunch of bureaucracy, which is typical to different languages, like the different word order in the sense, I really love you or je t'aime vraiment. So we have done this now for English and Urdu. So we have shown that these circuits, circuits equate English and Urdu. Why Urdu? Because I was a smart guy who spoke Urdu and I hired him. <laughs> so that, that's how it works. Is he here, Hamza? No, I don't see him. Uh, another thing which we discovered is, I mean, you got people who know that sim simping, uh, speaking with simple sentences is much better than with complicated ones. Like Alice sees Bob dance clumsily, Alice laughs at Bob, Bob is drunk, Alice is up. And there are people who want to show off, show, show off because they don't actually have much to say and they speak with complicated sentences. Sober Alice who sees drunk Bob clumsily dance laughs at him. Again, everything becomes the same. So what we found here is sort of a language and style neutral representation of language, which, which carries all the content. Because obviously we say the same thing in different languages, up to some subtleties, like of course. So we've got now a representation of language which makes everything the same. Anyway, that's, that's sort of stuff we do too in our quantum computing company. Uh, anyway, that's pretty much all I had to say, I think. So if you want to hear more of this, you can always follow me on Twitter or something like that. And now I hand over to Matty. Oh, after all three? Okay. Okay. Actually, I, I stayed under my time. <laughs> We can do questions now. Let's do questions now. That's easier. Good after yeah, I'm well under my time. Um, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Any any questions? Okay. Uh, and Alex, I'll start with Alex first. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and then I repeat. But I don't know. But well, now I'm here anyway. So. <laughs> I just want to ask about Chinese or very different languages and if you can yeah, do this. Yeah, Chinese is no problem. Like for example, uh, we, we saw some people from a Japanese company and they had adopted uh, Lambic to Japanese. So you just type in in Japanese and it's still it's all the same. So there's no problem there. Okay, any other question? Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Matty Hogan. I'm a research scientist in the quantum uh, cryptography group. Um, right. So this is our group. We are like a human tour circuit. We are distributed in London, Oxford and Cambridge. So Florian's the head of the Quantum Crypto Research Group. Uh, he's in Cambridge. Ella's in London. Mafalda's Cambridge. Uh, Cam's in London. Sherilyn's in London. Stefano's in Brussels. He's our scientific advisor. Uh, Kieran uh, is currently remote. And Haley's going to be in London. So we're a mix of people who have a physics background, classical cryptography background, especially Ella. Uh, people who've invented a whole uh, subject in quantum cryptography. We have people who have kind of experimental background in physics. And we have a combination of skills. Oh, yeah. And we also have a ghost-like figure of uh, Richie Young, <laughs> who you saw present earlier, who now works completely on Lambeck, but was uh, very 
in... Oh, there he is, there he is. He's taking a picture of himself. <laughs> he's, uh, he's humble like that. <laughs> okay, cool. By the way, I'm here to answer the question of uh, what happens when you follow Bob. And the answer is going to be boring. So uh, the aims are, uh, so we want to research practical yet certifiable applications of noisy near-term quantum devices, so NISCI things, which are going to be um, applied to uh, cryptographic uh, tasks. And the reason we have classical cryptographers around, as well as people who have a background in quantum, is because we want to establish a quantum advantage over classical cryptography. We want to say why you should uh, use some of these technologies. Okay. And the, the applications that we, uh, well, we have multiple applications that we think about. The, the three main ones at the minute are random number generation, when I'm, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. Uh, quantum key distribution, which is a bit of a new direction for us. And something I've worked in a bit, which is quantum state certification and verification. Okay. So before I joined, there was uh, a bunch of research done in the quantum crypto group, which led to a product that came out at the end of last year called uh, Quantum Origin, or Origin to the Power of CQ. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of give an, an overview of what this Quantum Origin uh, product is and kind of the, the research background to it. Okay, so why do you care about randomness? Well, okay, here's, a, here's an asymmetric cryptographic protocol, so some public key crypto. Uh, Alice and Bob uh, share a public key, so Alice has announced the public key, but Alice also has a private key. Bob uses the public key to encode a message um, to make some ciphertext, which he then sends to Alice, and Alice then uh, decrypts using uh, the private key and gets the message back. Okay, so the generation of the public key and the private key, they have to be random, generated using random processes. And this is because the, the protocol is known. Under, so you have something called Kirchhoff, uh, Kirchhoff's principle, which says that you must have security even if everything in the crypto system is public, except the private key in this case. So everything else can be made public, um, but you must have security um, as long as the private key is kept private. So in this case, then, the best an adversary can do if they can intercept this communication and the public key is just guess randomly what the private key is and hope to get lucky. And um, that's their kind of ideal uh, strategy. So we require randomness in public key crypto systems, for example, and it has to be fundamentally unpredictable. So it can't just look random so, for example, if you look at the digits of pi, you, they look pretty random, but they're predictable, right? So, we need fundamental unpredictability, not just apparent randomness. The outputs should be uh, private to the user. And in order to justify things are uh, random, we require minimal and well-justified assumptions. And so, the goal is to give a checkable or certif a certifiable way of guaranteeing that we have fundamental unpredictability generated by devices um, based on minimal and well-justified assumptions. Okay, so this is the basic uh, task called randomness certification. Okay, so given a device, we rely on minimal and well-justified assumptions. So the gold standard for this kind of randomness certification is something called device independent certification, which will, here's, um, there are parallel sessions which are about this in the next couple of days. And this is where you have a device and you treat it as a black box and um, you even allow the possibility that this black box has been prepared by an adversary. And these are the most minimal assumptions you can make. And you want to show that there's a certifiable uh, process which generates randomness. So there's something you can check to make sure that this has got fundamental randomness coming out of it, even if you allowed an adversary to prepare this device. So at the moment in the literature, there are two main approaches to this, something called device independent randomness certification. One's based on something called um, quantum computational supremacy, where you have some single device and um, 
you can query this device and it can spit out some strings which you hope are fundamentally random and this device should run efficiently on a quantum computer so it should be a polynomial time quantum computation and the idea is you should be able to check that this is coming from a quantum computer and because quantum physics is fundamentally unpredictable this thing should have some randomness coming out of it and then the other approach is based on uh, quantum non-locality which you have multiple uh, non-communicating boxes and so you're testing kind of you know the fundamental laws of physics and so if you violate a bell inequality you demonstrate something is non-classical it could only been of um, produced by quantum devices quantum physics is unpredictable and that's why you've got randomness coming out of these devices unfortunately both of these approaches are pretty impractical so for the quantum computational supremacy experiments, we don't have an efficient way of verifying that the stuff is coming from a quantum computer. So we don't have a way of verifying a quantum computational supremacy. And in some ways, this is kind of the point. But anyway, so the whole point is you, would, you kind of have to simulate what this, this device is doing on a supercomputer compare your statistics to the statistics coming out of the device, and that is really inefficient. And then on the, on the other side, you've got loophole-free uh, bell tests, but they're demanding because you've got to prevent things from talking to each other. So in quantum origin, it, uh, what's going on behind the scenes though is you've got a single remote quantum device, and you're asking it to implement a quantum non-locality experiment, and using this to certify the randomness. So it's inspired by the thing that was on the right, but this is not device independent, so it does not meet this gold standard because a single device doing this, a very simple bell test can be classically simulated, okay? And we kind of have to assume that measurements are done at this single device have to be essentially non-communicating, which is kind of unrealistic, right? So we're really not thinking about this setting where we have a black box and it's been prepared by someone malicious. So, um, it is something weaker, it is semi-device independent. And the nice thing about semi-device independence is it's influenced by this device independence, but the idea is to make things practical. So what we do, for example, is add assumptions to this quantum non-locality setting. We assume our experimentalists in Colorado are non-malicious. I've met them, they're lovely people. <laughs> so I've not met a malicious one amongst them. They're really lovely. Uh, sorry. Um, so, uh, and then uh, we also say that a particular kind of crosstalk in the measurements is negligible, but we don't put assumptions on um, like the dimension, the kind of states that are being produced and things like this, but we do have to add some assumptions. And even with this, the downsides is the randomness generation, whilst giving excellent guarantees on randomness or min entropy, is very slow. And not everyone yet has one of these continuum machines on their desk. So we have to communicate to it over a public channel. So the randomness is public. So what we do is we combine some very weak randomness at a local device, which is private, with a strong source of randomness, like from the Honeywell devices, which is public, and we combine the best things of both to get to near perfect private randomness. And I don't know how I'm doing for time. But uh, what we do is we use a two source randomness extraction and we have to use um, efficient methods to do this. If you want something device independent, there's some previous work in this archive and we're hiring. Okay, and that's, that's 10 minutes. Um, so please come talk to me about our research interests. I've talked about one particular thing, but we've got lots of research interests. I'm happy to talk. We, there are also teams within Continuum that work on quantum optics and software engineering and cybersecurity. Email me but like good emails, not spam. Um, uh, and then we have like three current open positions. If you're, not, if you're interested in these positions, please come talk to me. Here is a link, which you'll probably not see because Bob's about to close my presentation. No, I'm waiting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Ross Duncan. As Bob mentioned earlier, I'm in charge of the quantum software arm of Continuum. Uh, I'm still using the old logo, mostly because Bob hates it. <laughs> so, um, so as Bob mentioned, Continuum is now the company formed from the merger of formerly known as Cambridge Quantum 
and a unit of Honeywell, which was Honeywell Quantum Solutions. So historically, Cambridge Quantum was a, basically a software company with some small bits of, of hardware activity around cybersecurity, and Honeywell Quantum Solutions were making ion traps. So that's kind of the two halves of the, the system. So I'm going to talk to you a bit more about the software side of the, uh, the business. So what is quantum software? What do we mean, what I mean when I say that? So kind of two things, big, big umbrella topics. First of all, the system software. And by that, I mean things like the compiler, the programming language that you write your algorithm in, the runtime system that runs it, the online services by which you talk to this whole distributed system, and also in the lower levels, there's a lot of theoretical work being done on quantum error correction. Um, the other big umbrella category would be applications of quantum computers. And so for us, the big, the big one at the moment is simulations, both of molecular systems and condensed matter systems. Um, other topics in this area would be things like machine learning, using um, quantum enhanced Monte Carlo methods across a variety of application domains, and natural language processing, which Bob's already talked about. And the third area of which overlaps with software would be security and crypto stuff, which Maddie already talked about. Okay, so why are we, what are we actually trying to do, right? So we have to zoom out from time to time. And what we want is for people to be able to use quantum computers to solve their problems. And the main thing that's stopping them from this, ob this objective, well, two main things, but let's start with the first one, is that at the moment quantum computers are extremely low-level things. And to make it work at all, you kind of have to know everything about everything. So good luck getting a chemist whose main interest is in making a better LED to go and learn all of quantum computing in order to be able to do this. So that's the main thing that the software that we're working on is for. So domain experts can be domain experts, and we can be quantum computing experts, and you can be quantum computing experts, and we don't have to know everything about everything. The rest of that stuff you can ignore. So my team includes the chemistry division of, of, quantum, of um, Continuum, and they recently released this uh, Inquanto software, which is a toolkit for doing computational chemistry using quantum algorithms. And the reason we want to do this is because there's strong reasons to believe that there actually is achievable quantum advantage for material simulation and molecular simulation. Unlike all the other software you've heard about today, this is not free software. This is extremely expensive software. So, what does it do? So what do chemists care about usually is computing properties of some systems, let's say molecular systems. And quantum chemistry from a theoretical level is fairly well understood. So if you look at the kind of right-hand side of this chart, you'll see um, methods which are exact, right? This is the exact simulation of the physics, but you also see that the cost of this is n factorial, where n is the number of electrons in your molecule, right? So you can do maybe simulate hydrogen with these kind of methods. Right? That's not so interesting. And as you go down the chart, you see that you can simulate bigger molecules but at less computational cost, but also at less accuracy. And so down at the bottom end of things here, you can compute these properties, but you're not really learning a whole lot from your computation because you just don't have enough accuracy. And so the goal of quantum computing and chemistry is not so much to do things faster, but that is the method of, by which we achieve our real goal, is to obtain better accuracy on things that we can already have good or not so good classical methods to do. Yeah? Um, okay. And so what does in quantum do? Well, as you can see, this is kind of a flow chart. I won't go into all the details, but on the left-hand side, it's like, oh, I know a lot about metals. So let me think about how to put this problem about the structure of metal crystals into the system, which then gets turned into a kind of quantum computing representation, which then gets turned into a, a, something we might solve with a particular algorithm, which gets turned into circuits, which run, which produce statistics, which get analyzed, which get computed into some kind of property of the system we care about. And so you can kind of see that this is like a multi-level thing, right? And there is no place to hide in this picture. A right answer has to come out the end and it has to come out in a reasonable amount of time. And so it's a, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a change of way of thinking of things where you can just prove one little result and then you're happy with yourself for the next six months. Everything has to work together. Um, so here is Irfan. Irfan's one of the people who works on the InQuanto product. Um, he's a chemistry 
um, person by background, and he spends all of his time thinking about molecules and spin orbitals and electrons and so on. And somehow, the software I just described to you turns this onto a bunch of quantum circuits, which get shipped to some dilution fridge somewhere in the States, and a bunch of st statistics come back. And what we would like is for this, uh, to, to explain how this possibly works, right? So the first thing to notice is that the quantum computer itself is a fairly limited thing, right? It's qubits don't live very long. So if you want to do anything there, you're in a hard real-time environment. And I'll give numbers on this in the near future. But beyond that, there's a bit more of a classical program that has to interact with the quantum computer to tell it what to do. This is not the actual control system. This is like, what circuit do I want? What measurements am I going to read? And go around this loop. So this should be fast. But then that itself lives in a bigger computation involving possibly multi-gigabyte Hamiltonians, which is something that chemists have in their systems which lives in some kind of slow database system. And then finally, there's also a compiler, which has to generate all this stuff. So when we think of it, quantum software, part of the job is working out which computational task lives in which time regime, which capabilities are required to carry out that task, what's actually the scope in terms of data. So Frank, in the talk about um, protoquipper, was talking about the two executions. This would kind of correspond to the first and last boxes on this slide, but there's actually more going on in a real system. Uh, so we've got to work out what is the right place for everything to happen. And um, it's worth remarking that there's a lot of quantum computers out there today. So superconducting machines from IBM, Google, various others, our own ion trap systems, uh, optical things from Quandela, among others. And um, some of these companies are further along in deploying than others are. So the other day I logged into my IBM Q system and there was all of these computers available to me to use with different, um, different numbers of qubits, different fidelities and so on. But they're real, right? They exist. You can tell they're real because two of them are not working that day. <laughs> but um, and each, each one of these things is like a real marvel of science and technology, right? Things that possibly couldn't even exist 10 years ago. Um, and the other thing about them is that they're all shit. Uh, by which I mean, they're all NISC. Sorry, that's the professional word for that. Um, and so NISC was this term coined by John Preskill, his noisy intermediate scale. Now, when he says intermediate scale, he means enough to be hard to simulate, but not enough for error correction. So this number 100 is in the original paper. There are already computers with more than that number of qubits out there. But this is the real killer. So what we mean by noisy is that everything has limited fidelity. Um, you have only a finite lifetime of the qubits. The errors that I've just mentioned above are not uniform across the device in all cases. Uh, they're not uniform across time in general. They can be correlated and non-Markovian and not always well understood at all. So basically what this is telling you is that everything sucks and it doesn't really matter how many qubits you have, because if you don't get deal with this noise somehow, you're not going to be able to use them all anyway. Um, so Christina earlier on today and Silas talked a bit about uh, Kermit, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But here's a, a real IBM system. This is its status as about two weeks ago. And if you read the various properties it has, you can see that your qubits on average will all be turned to noise in the time it takes you to do about 200 C0 gates. So that's a hard limit on how long your computation can take. In fact, because they're noisy, probably you, you can't do that many C0 gates anyway before everything turns to noise. So the first thing you want to do if you're trying to make quantum software that actually works is do less things with this computer. Uh, and so that's what the kind of goal of quantum compilation is. So quantum compilation is the main role of this software ticket, which is open source and free. Please download it. The instructions are on the slide. Um, and that's designed to make it easy to write and deploy software for NISC computers. Um, what, I'm not going to talk all too long about this. So what is it in its core? It's a C++ library, which is five minutes, which is for optimizing the circuits. It has a Python wrapper and has various extensions which make it compatible with everything else. Uh, and I've shown five extensions because these are pretty popular toolkits, but there actually are about 20 so we can integrate with lots of different systems. And I'll skip this in the interest of time. So some of the things you might be doing in the compiler is synthesizing um, operations from 
sub-circuits into, into the gates that are appropriate for your machine. You might be working with symbolic expressions, which can become quite complicated. In fact, a major bottleneck in the compiler is doing symbolic maths with, uh, with these expressions. Um, synthesizing sub-circuits from ZX terms, or Clifford Tableau, or phase polynomials, and basically everything, right? So we go for, if we've heard about it and it possibly works, we try to put it in the compiler. Okay. And then the other thing, which I will go even faster on, is error mitigation. So error correction means we try not to have errors, right? We use this code space, as you all heard in Alex's talk yesterday, and we try to detect when something's gone wrong and fix it. So the statistics that come out at the end are the right statistics. Error mitigation, as Christina explained, is we try to fix up the statistics afterwards. And so we get the right answer. And so that's what Kermit is for. It is also free and open source, and you can install it using, Pyta, using PIP. So try it out. Um, I will skip all this. But the main point of interest here is that Kermit has this compositional structure, which I think is quite interesting for this audience, because here's a little graph of spam correction, which Sila showed you, and here's spam correction and frame randomization combined. And when you actually draw the lines on it, you see that it looks like this kind of comb structure we see in all these higher order uh, programs. And so if I'm gonna sum up the kind of work we're doing here in, well, here in Cambridge, uh, is trying to find ways to work around or mitigate or avoid all the kind of problems of current day quantum technology to try to get to something that's going to work before we have millions of qubits, right? Thousands of qubits are coming soon. Uh, so one question I'm going to anticipate is, are well, you in the private sector? Do you have to keep everything a secret and not talk to anyone? And the answer is no. These are some of the ongoing collaborations we have with various academics and public institutions on quite a wide range of topics. I'll not read them all out. And the, I wanna just end by doing a little bit of advertising. So uh, a long time ago, there was QPL1. This is the web page. it's still alive. Um, and you can see, I'm still alive. <laughs> now, I, I tried to count, I think there are four people here who were at this workshop. So Bob was one of them, I was one of them, Sam Staten was one of them, and Belma Valiron was one of them. And if you were there and I forgot you, then please speak up. Um, and you can see that something's different, right? In the top line, the title doesn't say quantum physics and logic. It says quantum programming languages, which is what we thought was the main thing to work on at the time. And it seems the community felt that it was a bit premature for this topic. But as we've seen and we'll see in the next two days, we don't think it's premature anymore. And I'm quite happy to be involved in a new workshop, which is but not brand new. This will be the third instance, uh, which is Programming Languages for Quantum Computing. It's happening in September in Ljubljana, so it's co-located with ICFP. So those of you who are more in the programming side of the world and the quantum side of the world will probably find that quite interesting. You've missed the deadline, sorry, but you can still come to the workshop and lots of interesting talks will be there. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say, apart from thanks, and we're always hiring. Yeah. You know, we produce T-shirts for, for ourselves. Some look really cool, and some others are told, the CEO told me to burn. <laughs> they are available on request. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ross, Matty, and Bob. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two questions. One or two questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. Hi, Ross. Um, I'm from uh, Waterloo IQC in Canada. And actually, from what I observed, that um, the intellectual property protection is pretty extreme in North America. So I wonder if I'm in the institute that is not in the list that you listed above, can I, can I start or have a collaboration with Continuum? Or someone must be in those institute? So. This list was not comprehensive because we've got different people. Yeah. So the, the simplest way to do this is if everything is going to be published and or open source, there's no problem. Yeah, the problem is, is universities who want to assert ownership of everything and then no deals can be made. So it can be done. 
um, but it can be complicated. So, so we still supervise lots of PhD and MSc students at different universities too. So all these things are possible. I mean, universities are now even more sharky about IP than some private companies, by the way. But it should be said that North American universities tend to be a lot better about this than British ones. One question. Are you planning to go into fault tagging? Are you planning to go into fault tagging? Yeah, we have like 10 people working on that. <laughs> I mean, we, we work with uh, a lot of quantum optics places now, and that's all. We work with a lot of quantum optics companies because ZX calculus and that is particularly suited for MBQC. So we, we talk to Psi, we talk to Quandella and all that, so, and that's all fault tolerant. Yeah, and the, the American team did recently present a paper where they demonstrated uh, logical qubits, pseudo threshold higher than physical qubits. So they're well on the way. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, first of all, just to say thank you to the organizers of QPL. It's amazing to be back here after a couple of years of doing things remotely. Uh, I think I haven't been to quite as many QPLs as Ross, but I was counting. I think I've been to, I've been participated in every QPL since 2009. So two years of kind of a remote felt felt difficult. So great to be back here. It's unusual to be at the industry session for me. Um, but today I'll talk to you about Condela. Um, probably many of you didn't hear about Condela before or before this week anyway. Um, so I'll tell you some things, just very general things about the company and the background uh, first. And then later we go into a little bit more detail on some things that we're doing and Pierre Manuel will do some demos for you as well. So the background is, um, is a startup that began in 2017, which actually makes it relatively old in the landscape of quantum computing. Um, it's originally a spin-off from an academic group, uh, the group of Pascal Senlar, who's, um, who's a semiconductor physicist. And Nicolo and Valerian were a postdoc and PhD student with her at the time. They published this paper where they were efficiently producing single photons of sufficiently high quality to be interesting for quantum computing and other kinds of quantum information protocols. And they got a lot of um, they got a lot of contact about this paper. People contacted them asking, can we get a hold of these sources? Can you provide us with some? And so that was the genesis of the company. And its early life was very much focused on this hardware. And so Condela has many hardware clients. Uh, here are just some of them. Um, as you see, we work a lot with, um, well, actually both with research groups and, and other startups, uh, particularly in Europe, but not, not exclusively. Um, so that's kind of the, the, hardware, um, the hardware period of Condela. And since uh, 2020, which is um, well, essentially since I arrived also, uh, we've changed direction. And so the hardware activity stays on. It's very much at the core of what we do but we've moved to what people might call full stack quantum compu computing. So, um, so now we have uh, teams spread across on, on my side, theory and algorithms, applications and software. Uh, while we still have the, the hardware and lab expertise in um, semiconductor physics and increasingly quantum optics. Um, and so we're about 50 people now. Um, the photos don't stay up to date because we recruit so so rapidly, but um, that's relatively recent. Uh, we're all working very hard at the moment on uh, making a six photon platform available later this year. So that's a stepping stone to, to other things, but uh, that's something that will be available on the cloud later this year. And then just for the theory and algorithms team more specifically, this is again, relatively recent. We can't keep up to date, but uh, it's a relatively recent picture of the algorithms team. And so you'll recognize a couple of other faces who are here this week. So Nicola Artel, um, who spoke yesterday, um, talked about the love calculus and uh, Pierre Manuel, who's going to talk shortly. 
So a bit of background and then just to say where we where we are. So we're mostly based in the Paris region. Um, we have offices in Paris. The main lab activities are in Massey, just outside of Paris. And then um, the clean rooms facilities are mainly in Palazzo, a long way outside of Paris, <laughs> depending on how you count it. It's also an office in Munich now, but I've actually I've, I've not been there yet, so I have no photo to show you of that. All right, so that's some background about the company. Um, but then let me try to get into a, a little bit more of, of what we're doing or what things look like at our place. So um, this is a very rough schematic, which I think would be useful for getting an idea of how our photonic platforms can look. Um, it's modular, um, and so broken it up into three main components here. So the first is we need to generate some photons. So we've got uh, photon sources. These sources, they operate, they're, they're in a fridge at 4 Kelvin. That's actually relatively modest uh, cooling compared to what you see with other um, quantum computing architectures uh, where you might be at milli Kelvin or something and the demands are much, much more serious. Uh, here, the cryogenics is like something the size, you can do pretty much things at the size of a briefcase here. Um, so that's, we generate the photons. And then we fiber them. So I'm really talking about just um, optical fibers. Uh, we plug them into um, a circuit. So this is not a quantum circuit of the kind that you're usually that you would usually think of. This is more like the kind of circuits that you would have seen in the talks yesterday, from Giovanni and from Nicola. And so it's um, it's a linear optical circuit built up of beam splitters and phase shifters. Essentially, it can be some other things. And some of these components are parameterizable. And so it's by playing with these parameters that you hope to encode information on the photons and you hope to process them in some way. And then they come out the other end, we fiber them up to detectors, again, cools down, um, and we, uh, we detect where the photons emerge. We build, and we build up a statistics of this. So typically you can generate photons, I mean, in principle, millions per second. So. Uh, can build up statistics rather rapidly. So there's some things I haven't mentioned in this schematic. Um, you'll notice feed forward is not here. That's something that is necessary to do universal quantum computing. It's very feasible. Uh, it's just didn't want to overcomplicate things in this picture. Okay, so that's how the schematic looks, but then uh, you might wonder how one of these things actually looks if you came and visited the Condella Labs, and people can come and visit the Condella Labs. Um, so if you're in the Paris region, get in touch. Um, the devices essentially look like this. We try to put everything into these big blue boxes, and, um, and we have different shelves uh, on the rack, and they contain all the various modules that we need for this to function. So at the bottom, we have uh, cryogenically cooled sources and detectors. Um, this next, the moving up, you have a, a demultiplexer, we call it. So at present, we're using single sources, which emit photons in a stream, temporal stream. Our demultiplexer routes them into different paths, applies some delays. And then we have, uh, we have rows of photons that are ready to be simultaneously introduced into the chips after this process. Uh, we have a control module for some of the, um, for some of the electronics on the, on the circuit, the circuit itself, and then there are lasers and electronics which we need to pump the sources. Um, and of course, there's a classical computer to make all of this hardware run and which we can connect to uh, from our offices. So we can sit in the comfort of our offices and have this running in the lab. And you have these nice uh, dashboards where you can read the statistics off in real time and see how it's functioning. Um, so I'd like to say some, a little bit more about what we have in the two pictures. So in the bottom picture, that, that, that's what the sources look like today. I'd like to say a little bit more about that. And then I'll come around to saying something about the circuits as well. Um, so the, the core of the technology really at Condella, it, 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 it's where it started, was with these uh, quantum dot uh, single photon sources. And so a quantum dot, it's, uh, in practice, it's a, it's a defect in a semiconductor material, but it behaves like an artificial atom. So uh, a two-level system. Uh, we can excite it by, uh, by, by shining a laser at it. It goes to an excited state, and when it relaxes, it releases a photon. So our dot is in the middle of a pillar that's 
that's constructed around it. And the pillar is constructed around it to form an optical cavity, which makes it, um, well, it makes the release of the photon directional, so it's easy to pick up, so you don't lose it because it goes in some random direction. And it also allows for uh, well, fast coupling with the lasers and so on. So originally what was happening, um, we used to produce these sources um, on chips. You can see the electron microscope image of how those pillars look on a chip. And you can see a picture of the chips themselves as they were first uh, being sold. And what you would do is you would put, uh, you'd put a lens sitting above the chip to collect the photons as they came out. Nowadays, in the more recent sources, we actually we um, we actually glue a fiber directly onto the top of the onto the top of the dot, so we have minimal loss coming out. So it's directly into the fiber. Um, so those are the sources we look at. I give I say I say a few things a little more technically about sources because I I mean it's uh, slightly unusual material maybe for the QPL conference, but. Um, I think it helps to understand what's at stake here. So you can ask what makes a good source, and essentially there are three, there are three very important, um, very important factors. Uh, the first one is brightness, which is essentially the probability of getting a photon when you shine a laser at it and you ask for the photon. Uh, the second one is indistinguishability, so is how similar those the photons are that come from this source. So this is crucial if we want uh, bosonic interactions and if we want the kind of statistics that essentially we design our circuits for later. So um, any distinguishability in the photons leads to errors in our, in our processing. So that's a very key measure. And the third one is purity. Um, so the idea is if you ask for a single photon, you should really get a single photon and not a pair or a triple of, of photons, which similarly will mess with your protocols and algorithms if you design them to work with single, single photons. So um, our technology is quantum dots. They, um, well, they outperform the traditional sources which come from a probabilistic process known as spontaneous parametric down conversion, uh, which physicists will be familiar with, but which sounds intimidating otherwise. Um, there's a point with those sources, which is that they, they need to trade off purity and and brightness, so it's very or it's impossible to 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 have high values on both of these at once. So um, with quantum dots, we're actually we're we're pushing towards kind of the the ideal of having both um, near unit brightness and uh, purity at the same time. And maybe to give a little more information. So the, sponta the spontaneous parametric down conversion, the more traditional way of generating single photons, is this probabilistic process which actually generates pairs of photons. You don't know when it's going to happen. So you put a detector on one of the, on one of the paths where you expect to see the photons emerge, which tells you when there's a photon in the other path. It's a probabilistic process. And if you look at the statistics for emission, uh, you find that uh, uh, the, the um, the rate of double emissions is proportional to the to the brightness. So, this is a, a kind of a fundamental limit to the, to those kinds of sources. And so, some of our competitors in photonic quantum computing work with these, but then have to go through massive um, parallelization of sources and then routing net, fast switching and routing networks to generate enough photons at a time to do interesting algorithms. Whereas, in principle, um, single Candela source does the trick. Okay, so that's about the sources and then maybe very briefly about the chip. We've seen some interesting things about, uh, about these yesterday. So um, we're talking about linear optical circuits. Uh, so they're built up of things like beam splitters and phase shifters, not only, but in practice when we do things on chip, we're often just using those. Um, We've seen some formalizations of this yesterday in the talks from, from Nicola and from Giovanni. Um, and so that's essentially what we're working with. Uh, something that's very important to note, or very interesting to note, I think, is that photons are, are not qubits. They're not directly qubits. Um, we can encode qubits in photons in a variety of ways, but um, in themselves, they're not naturally qubits. So somehow we have to impose that on them. And an interesting point is that um, computations with photons as the kind of basic informational unit in themselves 
can also be very interesting. So there's an example that people may have heard of, it's boson sampling. And so in a sense, you could say this is a kind of a photon native example of quantum advantage. Um, so boson sampling, essentially what you do is you, you think about putting some number of photons into some big generic cascade of beam splitters and phase shifters. You choose the phases such that you're implementing a higher random unitary, but okay, you ch you're choosing them randomly in some sense. And the problem is to predict uh, where they're going to, going to emerge. And so this is a, a, a problem that was proposed by Aronson and Arkhipov. Um, the probability of a given output, assign, uh, output arrangement of those photons, um, it relates to computing the permanent of a submatrix of the, of the unitary in question. And um, we know that per computing permanence is a sharply hard problem. So that's kind of where, where we get the results from. And of course, boson sampling has been the source of several claims of demonstrated quantum advantage. Now I say claims because I realize there's some debate about whether these are genuine quantum advantages yet, or whether some clever classical simulations that capitalize on noise and things can catch up. But um, I think it shows there's a very interesting thing to think about photons in their own right sometimes. So uh, this is the point at which I hand over to Pierre Manuel to uh, talk to you a little bit and maybe give some demonstration of some of our software. So I'm going to tell you why photons are a bit peculiar. So um, what's cool about photons is that they have a very, like in principle, an infinite coherence time. So of course, you're going to lose some photons if you take uh, too much time. But in principle, like they have a very long coherence time. So the, the downside is that they, they, it's a trouble to have two photons interaction. And so if I go back to what Giovanni was saying uh, yesterday, so one way to encode logical information in, into photons is to use dual ray encoding in which um, the position of a, photo, of a photon in a, in a wire will indicate uh, its log logical state. Um, so if, for instance, here, if you want to encode uh, the input state 0, 0, you just put a, a photon in, uh, in the top wire in each uh, two modes to, to emulate that. The main problem is that you end up sometimes with this kind of um, schemes where two photons arrive at the wrong, at the wrong part and then you can't interpret that back in the logical space. So it may not be a problem if you want to do like a boson, boson sampling type experiment where you just care about like folk state statistics. But if you want to remain in, um, in the logical space, then it, it might get tricky. So that's what uh, Giovanni was saying yesterday, basically. And so you have solutions for that. So you can, for instance, post-select on the different outputs within the logical sub subspace. So basically making sure that you have um, one photon in every uh, two modes. Um, or you can use auxiliary modes, like uh, auxiliary modes to, to, to also do post-section on them. And then uh, um, a good post-section scheme would just herald the present, the, 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 that the gates have been performed successfully. So for instance, uh, here is an example of how you do a bell state in photonics, but it's only a post-selected bell state. So basically you do two beam splitters and a swap of the middle modes. And if you do that, you end up with this weird uh, looking state at the end, it's a fox, fox state, which doesn't have an interpretation in the logical space. But if you do post selection, so if you ensure that you have one photon per two modes, then you suppress the first and the last term, and you end up having a post selected bell state. So this is the kind of schemes you can use if you want to do uh, some kind of uh, logical computation, like go back to the logical space. But again, like it's not only what you can do, like uh, you can do boson sampling type experiments, or if you want to do variational quantum algorithm, you don't really need to c care about logical encoding. Um, so here was um, a few things on, uh, on weirdness of photons. Um, also at Candela, we developed um, our own simulator because we weren't, we weren't happy about what's, what wasn't uh, like available um, to simulate what we were doing, so we like coded our own simulator. So it's called Persova. So it allows to like simulate the kind of picture uh, Shane was showing before. So with single photons, an interferometer, and then uh, fog state statistics at the end. 
um, and it will also allow to like do some implementation on the real hardware when uh, when it will be available. Um, so it's open source; you can download it, uh, participate, um, do your own code, uh, submit it, etc., etc. Um, it allows like there are a variety of backends on Percival, so you have. Um, kind of different backends depending on what you want to do, if you want to do sampling experiments, if you want to compute the priority of one specific specific output, if you want to compute the, the priority of all outputs, etc., etc. So you have different backends. And one of the backends was actually developed uh, at Candela by uh, Nicola Shane and Jean and also with uh, with uh, Benoit Valiron here. Uh, so basically it's um, it's a very neat algorithm that's tra that's trading um, a time for memory. So when you want to to compute several outputs at the end, it amounts to calculating a lot of permanence, and sometimes you can just store some some permanence to do like following computation for other outputs. So if you manage to to, to have more memories, then you can do your, your computation much more efficiently in time. Uh, and also recently, so recently like uh, three days ago or on Monday, um, Percival is now featuring the, um, the rewriting rules from the love calculus that is being developed with. Uh, with Simon, uh, Alexandre, uh, Benoit, Shane, a uh, lot of people. Um, so now I'm going to present you some some example uh, of uh, implementation of Percival. So does that work if I just uh... cool? Okay. So this is a Percival land page where you can find the code, the documentation, and a forum. Also, if you have new requests or questions on how to use Percival. Uh, so here I'm going to present you some uh, examples. So Giovanni yesterday presented you the, uh, the Engu model experiment, how he mentioned it, I, I think, at some point. Um, and also this morning, uh, Lorenzo uh, talked about some, some kind of uh, um, max and the of pointer experiment. So this is something you can implement natively in, uh, in Percival. Um, so you just, so here just uh, running some, like uploading some, some libraries. So now you, you can uh, simply choose the backend you want. So you have four backends available. Um, to define a state, you just use a, a class from Percival and just put the number of photons you want. So if you want a fog state with one photon in the first mode, one photon in the second mode, you just put the state 1-1. One, one, it's going to. Yeah. Do I have the internet now? OK. Um, well, it should be running. I don't know why it's not running, but okay. Um, then, if you, like, it's a bit like Qiskit, if you want, uh, like you can play around like that. But instead of having quantum logic gates, you have photonic gates. So, if you want to implement a, a beam splitter, you just like define a beam splitter, um, and then you can have the matrix, the initial matrix CT to a beam splitter. You can change the end goal to have like a purely transmittive beam splitter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it's very photonic oriented um, software because we want to actually uh, be able to uh, take a photonic experiment and implement that and see how it looks. So the other um, main component in in an interferometer is a phase shifter. So same, you can just uh, define it, uh, and of course the neutral matrix is just uh, it's acting a single mode, so it's it's very Easy, and so if you want to test for for the Engu model effect, um, you use, for instance, circuit analyzer. So you just put your beam splitter here, your input state one one, and you look at the statistics. And of course, you see that your photons are, are bunching, so you don't you cancel the the, the term one one. Um, so yeah, this is cool. So basically, um, we've been looking at different like photonic papers that have been published past the year and trying to implement that on, on Percival, so you can find a bunch of uh, implementation on, on the documentation page as well. Um, here I, I will be showing you briefly uh, what Nicola has been showing you yesterday, the rewriting rules implementing Percival. So uh, basically here um, what's been defined are just the rewriting rules translated to Percival, so you, like I mean it's pretty easy, again it's just beam splitters and phase shifters, you just need to define Kiskit like uh, the, the the right diagrams. Um, if like this is a rule, you just you just fuse the phase, etc. etc. So you can encode a bunch of uh, rules that you will need to uh, rewrite your uh, your circuit with. And so 
at the end, so I'm skipping a bunch of uh, code. But yeah, at the end, it's like what Nicolas showed yesterday. So you can rewrite the circuit using the rewriting rule in the form you want. Um, yeah. It's almost over. Ta -da. Um, and so, yeah, as I, me I was mentioning, we're also looking at a different, uh, like reproducing some, some photo ink papers. So I'm not like going to comment on the usefulness of this paper, but I mean, just from like, um, like it's interesting for us just to take a paper and trying to reproduce that and see how it perform or et cetera, et cetera. So here we are we're trying to reproduce a paper about um, um, variational quantum algorithm where you have uh, interferometers universal ones that are sandwiching uh, like an encoding layer with phase shifters. Uh, and the idea is to apply that to solve a partial differential equation or clustering data. Um, and so this is a notebook to, um, to cluster data. So I'm going to go through quickly through it, but uh, at the end, bas basically, it, it works and you can cluster data. So here is two blobs separation, and you see that it performs quite well. On circular data, it does also quite well, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I mean, the idea was mainly to try and implement a bunch of papers. Uh, and we can do that. And it runs quite efficiently with state-of-the-art simulation. So this is quite cool. And I'll let you conclude. Uh, let me. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. All right. So what we should say about uh, Percival? So yes, we could reproduce experiments with it, and the experimentalists are actually very excited about it. So it's uh, it's a funny tool because it's actually at the same time very interesting to theory people who like just like playing around with new software and um, building algorithms, but also uh, the experimentalists, um, the people who work in the lab with actual optics experiments and. They're plugging these, literally these components together all day and they're wondering what they're going to do. So it's been a big help to them. But uh, so Pierre Manuel mentioned the backends, uh, the simulation backends. And so we've worked quite hard on those, but they're also uh, later in the year, you'll be able to actually run your Percival code on actual Condata platforms. So um, the final message, uh, well, we're very open to collaboration. So similar to what uh, Ross was saying, uh, we're not trying to be a black box and do everything in a vacuum. Uh, we're working, I mean, working with Simon and, uh, and Benoit and Alexandre in particular here at QPL, but uh, very open to working with everyone. Um, we're also growing, the teams are growing, so we're hiring. So if you're interested, um, come and talk to me or, or one of the others here this week. Um, hopefully, just gave a taster of some things that can maybe suggest to you that the photonic approach is full of interesting problems. Uh, often you can pose very similar questions to what you're used to posing in regular quantum information, and the answers are not necessarily the same, which is quite fascinating and exciting. Um, also, we've touched on a few of the projects that we have here. We have many other active projects which also touch on things like uh, benchmarking error mitigation, quantum random number generation. Um, if you're interested and you want to keep up to date with our publications, uh, you can find everything at, uh, at the website at condela.com. So thank you. Two questions, I suppose. When you optimize your circuit, are the beam splitters as uh, expensive as phase shifters? Or is there any difference? Can you repeat the question? When you optimize your circuit to reduce the number of beam splitters and phase shifters, is there any difference in cost between those two? So it's not um, a reduction of number of components, more a rewriting of, uh, of the, the circuit. So basically, in optics, what's 
if you have M modes, you have a unit tree that describes the M mode and you have a universal way of uh, implementing that unit tree. So, so yeah, so optimization is it's a slightly different problem when you're in the purely photonic world because there is always a, there, there is a, there, there are normal forms. So the, in particular, you can go to this triangular normal form, and so you, I mean you always know what you can reduce to. So it, it's not a, it's not a very difficult problem. In practice, um, uh, yes, I mean in practice you could wonder whether beam splitters or phase shifters cost more. Actually, it's it's also an interesting problem. So depending on the material that you're that you're using for your integrated circuits, uh, different operations are more costly. So that's something that's not yet in the software, but which is very compatible with like over overlaying with it kind of resource theoretic pr perspective thinking of it. And like that, it's different for every material that you would, that you would try. Hey, thanks for the talk, guys. This is really cool. Um, you, you, you said pretty casually, Shane, uh, you were talking about feed forward. You were saying, oh, we can do we can do feed forward. Is that is that something that you've implemented or, or has been implemented? Um, uh, so it has been done for a long time in photonics. It's not something that we have running in our lab at the moment, but it is something that's coming soon. Is that um, incorporating something like delay lines or something into this uh, yeah, exactly. architecture so, that um, you showed? Yeah, so there's some interest. I mean, interesting things about photons, right? They have um, they have very long uh, coherence time. So there's a, there's a Terry Rudolph paper where he makes a joke. I mean, joke, he's kind of serious, I think. He talks about like um, light from uh, the Lyman alpha blob, one of these like, uh, one of these uh, events at the edge of the visible universe having held this polarization for like 13.5 billion years or something. Mm -hmm. And it's true, like in a transparent medium, you're, you don't, so coherence time is, is good. And um, so what you can use as a memory is just like a basic, fiber just a long enough fiber for you to for you to do your switching in between and so yes that is that is the route that we're pursuing i think there is one more question from ross uh, so i'll just ask if you would like if i understood what you were saying the the hardware is ideal for computing for doing boson sampling and everything else you pay some kind of encoding overhead is that right Yes. Right, yeah. Cool. Yeah. But then you can go to NDQC and then, you know, like what you were saying, like the picture changes and... Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, since we have pretty far along today, I was, thought I would keep my presentation relatively short. Uh, maybe one of my main goals is to demystify maybe um, the company I'm working with um, and then show uh, one very uh, simple example of the quantum software we are currently developing. So uh, my name is Damien Nguyen. Um, this is my email address. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Glenn Winska, who is more into the um, logic theory, if that's correct, um, and I'm more towards the uh, software development side. So as I said, my talk is fairly simple, um, talking about Huawei, uh, Huawei research uh, in general, what we do, uh, and then a very small uh, example uh, showing some benchmark results uh, that we have obtained recently, um, and then uh, be ready to, to answer any questions you might have. So Huawei, Huawei research in general, Huawei is a Chinese company uh, that is uh, 35 years old this year. Uh, we have about 190 7,000 permanent employees um, worldwide uh, in 170 plus countries. Um, we have about as many uh, contract employees um, uh, working for us. And um, something that's maybe um, not as well known is that uh, Huawei invests heavily into uh, research, R&D, and basic research since uh, more than 50% of our employees worldwide uh, actually work. Uh, in R&D. We are also one of the largest companies investing into R&D uh, worldwide. Uh, this changes from year to year. I don't remember if that's from last year or the year before. Um, 
but um, Huawei is since inception uh, being invested into R&D and also long-term projects like quantum computing. Um, initially, Huawei was uh, essentially an IC company working for telecommunication infrastructure, so uh, providing uh, cell towers. Um, then we moved into the consumer business with smartphones, uh, and now uh, we, have, we are actually an ICT company, meaning that we uh, do provide also, um, we have cloud business units. Uh, we also work with uh, enterprises to build um, uh, supercomputers, uh, we have our own chips um, design, uh, part of which is done in the UK. Um, and uh, we basically have um, people working into selling products in uh, almost all categories of ICT and also people doing research. That's maybe uh, most important uh, here uh, in all of those, um, all of those fields. Um, one of those slides, we have a uh, presence uh, almost everywhere uh, in Europe. Uh, so we have research centers uh, in the UK, in France, um, in Switzerland, where I'm based, uh, in Germany, Austria, Russia, Finland, um, you name it. Um, the quantum research uh, is mostly done uh, in Russia and in China at the moment, although we are trying to um, build more capabilities uh, locally uh, from Zurich. Um, one last slide, just to mention a little bit about what we're doing in Europe. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, 1,600 uh, industry partners with which we collaborate on uh, research. Um, we have technical collaboration projects, and we also invest heavily into um, promoting uh, and uh, enabling uh, fundamental research uh, in collaboration with universities, um, not only in the quantum computing uh, domain, but in uh, computing uh, generally, uh, wherever we are. That was it. Um, short um, introduction uh, on Huawei. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them afterwards. Um, now I'm just going to mention a few more things about um, quantum computing at Huawei um, and uh, essentially just present uh, one result um, from some of my uh, colleagues in China. So um, the idea for Huawei being part of quantum computing is we would like, uh, since we are a hardware manufacturer for smartphones and base stations, we also have an energy uh, division, um, Huawei uh, would like to be part of this, although we are slightly uh, late uh, to the game compared to other companies, um, but the will is really to have something, an integrated solution, uh, providing both hardware um, uh, all the way up to software and uh, possibly in the near future also uh, cloud access, uh, a bit like what uh, IBM and other companies are proposing. Um, okay. So the software that um, we are currently working on is called Mind Quantum. Um, some of you might have been puzzled looking at the QPL website, seeing a logo called MindSpore uh, and not the Huawei logo. The reason is um, the team working uh, on the quantum computing side is also collaborating a lot with the team working at MindSpore. MindSpore is essentially uh, Huawei's uh, framework for tensor um, calculation. So the kind of the same thing as TensorFlow, but um, in the Huawei universe, if you like. And um, Mind Quantum was initially uh, developed um, into allowing uh, quantum machine learning applications. Um, and it's now slowly growing into becoming, um, hopefully, um, in a few uh, years, a uh, more complete and integrated solution for all quantum computations. Um, so, as the slide says, it's, uh, the hope is to have a general purpose quantum computing library, uh, which, in which includes everything from um, uh, applications to algorithms uh, to uh, the basic compiler and simulators. Um, I've, this slide is slightly packed with information, but I thought this was a good way to uh, summarize everything. Um, so, Mind Quantum is a Python and C++ package uh, that's available on PyPy. Um, it's also available on Gitty, which is the uh, GitHub equivalent uh, that was uh, uh, deployed in China due to um, obvious reasons uh, lately. Um, but everything is mirrored on GitHub. 
Um, as I mentioned in the slides, the GitHub repository is uh, not monitored. Um, so if you have, uh, if, you, if some of you, uh, I can, if I can convince some of you to um, uh, provide some some code or fix some issues or help us um, develop our software, then um, feel free to either um, submit those directly on the Gitty, so um, at the official one or uh, on my fork uh, where I, I will monitor things. Documentation is also uh, online, open source. Um, you can also find at the same address, so mindspore.cn, the uh, full documentation for uh, Mindspore, so the TensorFlow uh, that we are developing. Um, so what kind of application are we looking for for Mind Quantum? Um, so the example I will be talking about is, uh, I'll be showing you later on, is uh, based on QAOA, um, but we do also have some people working in uh, quantum natural language processing. So the small, uh, very simple example, I promise, because it's late and uh, sometime soon we want to have some dinner. Um, uh, the problem that I propose to solve is just solving a simple max cut problem. So you essentially have a graph and you need to find a solution uh, to divide the graph into two parts. Um, and you want to basically maximum the number of edges that you cut. The example is fully available online uh, at the address I have put below. Um, if you go to the address uh, mindspot.cn and you go to the Mind Quantum page, you should be able to find it very easily. Um, so this is the last slide um, with equation on it. Um, then I'll be basically just showing a little bit of code and some pictures. Um, so this is to summarize and formalize the problem we're trying to solve and um, uh, specifying which Hamiltonian we are using and why it makes sense uh, to define it that way. Um, and so now, uh, just showing the code that you actually need to implement this uh, in our um, software. Um, so you basically have to import a bunch of um, libraries, uh, define a bunch of functions in order to uh, build up the quantum circuit um, that uh, you need. Uh, there's a second page uh, because I couldn't fit everything. Um, and then um, we, uh, we can draw the graph um, to solve the problem. Um, and then um, this is maybe a bit small. So uh, the first part is just setting up uh, Mindspore. Uh, Mindspore supports our um, uh, multiple uh, backends uh, in order to do the tensor uh, calculations. So we obviously support uh, our own ASCEND chips. Uh, that's what we internally develops for uh, machine learning applications. Um, in this case here, we just uh, don't care really. We just uh, use the CPU. Um, then we essentially just set up um, the Hamiltonian and build up everything by using the functions I uh, defined previously, also defining the circuit. Um, we uh, create a simulator and also uh, create a um, operations that we are going to then use uh, in order to combine this uh, with the um, tensor calculation uh, using Mindspore. Uh, and then the last part is just uh, using um, Mind Quantum uh, in order to build up all the layers that you need, um, allocating the um, optimizer that we'll be using, and then just basically calling um, the uh, training uh, on your net. Uh, in order to solve the issue. Um, then you can obviously print out um, the, the, the results as they are uh, being optimized after each optimization pass, for example. Um, and then at the end of the day, you essentially uh, reach um, a solution. And in this particular case, um, I should mention the video is showing a different case. Um, I couldn't get my hand on the correct one, unfortunately. Um, and uh, according to the probability distribution in this case, we have um, for degenerate solution, and um, we have equal probabilities uh, for all of them. Um, with that being said, um, at almost to the end, because I really didn't want to, for this to take too long, uh, a few benchmark results. Um, uh, some of my colleagues recently um, ran the experiments using multiple um, different um, uh, softwares. Uh, Puzzle Quantum is the one developed by Baidu in China, um, and otherwise uh, the other ones uh, you should be very familiar with. Um, and uh, you have the QAOA max cut uh, problems here with uh, 4, 6, 8, and 10 qubits. 
Um, and um, they also ran a few VQE experiments. Um, and in uh, most cases, um, uh, we seem to be running fairly efficiently. Although I should mention, uh, and this is also on the slide, um, that this is only using the um, CPU versions of the software since uh, my quantum is not yet uh, able to run on GPU. We are currently working on that. So. With that being said, um, I hope I could at least convince you that Huawei is not only making smartphones. If the message is already there, that's already good. Um, otherwise, um, uh, Mind Quantum is a software uh, that's fairly young and it still needs to grow a little bit. So it's maybe not as feature rich and as mature as the other ones, but uh, we are working hard at it. Um, but we already have uh, some ex excellent performance results uh, compared to some other um, software suite that exists out there. And um, quick mention of some other works from our Russian colleagues uh, working on uh, multi-tensor contraction uh, algorithm uh, and simulator, uh, which uh, we follow the link here. With that being said, um, I'll thank you very much for your attention so far. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You actually have uh, plenty of time left, so it's I know. up to you. So. I, 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 I thought it would be good to have something to have a buffer for, you know, at the end of the day. It's your choice. So, yeah. Very good. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Um, actually, I remember this year at QIP, Baidu right. gave a presentation and they also introduced their Paddle Quantum. And I, know, I noticed that you compare your results with Paddle Quantum and shows that you have this much smaller number. My first question is, what do those numbers correspond to? So the numbers on the slides, I think I had it uh, at maybe a bit small, I apologize. Um, uh, it's times in seconds for running the 100 uh, or uh, 50 iterations in that case. Oh, so can I understand that? By comparing my quantum with paddle quantum, you're both doing, uh, carrying out a similar task, but your solution is much, much more efficient. Yes. Than the, and are you both doing the quantum machine learning task? Yes. So, so um, these results were for each um, software presented here, we're running the exact same task. I mean, so, yes. And sorry, uh, I know that I do have the same kind of development center. Are right. you kind of doing like a similar thing with them or you're doing something different from? Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly what Baidu is doing, but um, assuming, yes, we are kind of uh, doing the same thing and uh, we are competing essentially in that regards, maybe. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, could you please repeat uh, what uh, the uh, hardware capabilities or plans oh, of hardware capabilities or plans of Huawei are? You mean the hardware capabilities that we have, or yes? Uh, at the moment, um, we are. Uh, that's the one thing tonight where I will have to say that uh, I cannot tell you much about what we are currently doing because um, we are not ready yet to announce anything. But Huawei is working on uh, bringing some um, uh, publicly accessible quantum uh, computing hardware uh, on the market at some point in the future. And do we know about the type of? Um, so, as far as I, uh, I, what I can tell you is uh, Huawei is not fixed on any particular technology at the moment. Um, so, um, I think as far as I remember, um, iron traps and uh, um, maybe um, superconducting qubits at the moment. Although, I wouldn't exclude uh, the possibility that we have people working on photonics, for example, because we also have a big... Um, a division working obviously for smartphones and all that kind of things. Um, we also have people working on quantum key distribution uh, that was mostly in Munich. Um, so, but like for actual quantum hardware, most likely is the, uh, we are looking at multiple technologies. Uh, we haven't settled on one yet. Is there some uh, focus on uh, quantum neural networks also in the design of hardware? Um, uh, I'm assuming so, but I couldn't, uh, I will have to double check. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one question here. <laughs> Ross? <laughs> um, so thanks. I know that uh, Huawei is also working on programming languages and compilers right. in, your, in your Edinburgh branch. I was wondering if there's any work on developing quantum programming languages. 
Um, so we had discussions uh, recently uh, about that um, because um, yes, they are. Um, the question now it becomes how we um, need to internally reorganize this because they were not, they are now part of a different business unit. As it's private business uh, complicated uh, company stuff, but essentially, yes, we have some people uh, doing a little bit of that, uh, but we are trying to find a way now internally to formalize this uh, and, and have a more global approach to that. So it's, it's, it's not official yet, so to speak, but yes, we do have people um, uh, working on different parts of quantum computing or a different part of software, or basically any kind of field. One more? She has one more. Thank you. So I wonder, um, this is the latest benchmark results for two problems. Are, um, are you testing out your performance over a collection of problems to compare your, um, your efficiency with other compilers or just for some specific class of problems? Um, so in this case, it's just these two specific um, uh, types of problems, uh, but um, uh, during development we obviously benchmark on a wider range uh, of, of uh, softwares and uh, problems, um, but we haven't published anything yet. With all due respect, yes. have you encountered anything that you perform that is not as good as other yeah, compilers? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, oh. but, but we, I wouldn't show it on the slides, <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Can we repeat? I miss oh, yeah, so I have a cheeky question. Um, yes. So how good are the solutions that you find really fast? How good are the solutions that you find really fast? Um, so this is the one thing I haven't co uh, confirmed with my, my colleague that because uh, I wasn't the one generating the tasks. Um, but um, my assumption is that the the, the um, the algorithms uh, all reach uh, kind of the same type of accuracy. Although I would have to, don't quote me on that, but uh, I'm, it, we're not trying to mislead you uh, by showing you those results. So uh, my assumption is that yes, uh, they would all be running uh, to the same kind of accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing that I'll mention is that um, basically we stopped, uh, for the case of the MaxCal problem, we stopped at 10 qubits because then it became uh, difficult to actually benchmark against all the other software. Um, and so it's, it's not run on a supercomputer, by the way. It's just one node with, I think, 64 uh, cores or something. Um, but uh, they've been able to run some experiments using uh, Mind Quantum with up to 30 qubits, I think. It takes a while, uh, but it's not uh, unreasonable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and then if you use GPUs, how does that change? If you use GPUs, how does, how does that, that change? change? Um, good question. Uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. That's the best I can answer you. The, um, but as soon, we are working on the GPU implementation of a simulator, so uh, once that's done, uh, I'd be happy to um, generate a new graph with the uh, GPU numbers. No more questions. <laughs> anyway, I think you can, you can talk at the end. <laughs> I will be very brief. Uh, I will try to keep this under 10 minutes because I'm sure we're all tired after a few intense sessions and we all want to go get drinks and then food. But I just wanted to say something a little bit about what, uh, what we have been doing over the past couple of years and uh, what our plans are for the immediate future, so for the next year, year and a half, perhaps. Uh, just to start who we are, it's, um, Hashberg is a small startup. It was funded a couple of years ago after we tried to pitch some high-level quantum software spin-out uh, through the University of Oxford. The university was uh, fairly aggressive on its IP policy. Ultimately, it turns out the 
the environment wasn't just there in terms of funding, or at least the people we met believed in the quantum winter, overwhelmingly believed that quantum would just not happen in the next two years. Uh, so we decided to say, well, you know, screw it. We are going to do it ourselves. And we funded this small company. Uh, there's uh, two different uh, small teams. One of them is based in the UK, uh, mostly in London. And the other one is based in Genova, in uh, northern Italy, which is where uh, both the founders, myself and Nicolò, are from. We grew up there. Uh, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice sea town where all the houses are pastel colored and people are a bit grumpy, but ultimately will give you food and shelter if you need it. <laughs> Grudgingly, but they will. Um, we, we will be open to collaboration at some point in the near future, but we are currently in stealth mode. Everything we've been doing for the past couple of years is, is still very much work in progress. Some of it is more advanced and provides some funds. Some of it is uh, still to come or to be finished. But uh, it's approaching a point where it's, it's mature enough to talk about it. So I thought I would take the opportunity. And we do two separate things which seem kind of incompatible, but there is a, there is a point to it. There is a story why, why we do this. Uh, we do some stuff in finance, not quantum finance, classical finance. Um, nothing quantum there, I, I can guarantee. And then we do some quantum stuff. We work in uh, quantum software, and I will discuss uh, what our plans are, because I think that's the interesting thing for this particular audience. Um, and the reason we do finance is, well, that's where the money is, really. <laughs> um, if you want to go and do this without immediately taking uh, VC capital, you might want to think about other ways of getting money. And an easy way to do this was to start building some trading algorithms and some market analytics and cash in on that. So that's, that's the finance side of things, which is fun, to be fair. Uh, it's been, it's been a, lot, a lot of work and, and a lot of interesting uh, discoveries, but nonetheless, it's ultimately a means to an end. And the real end is quantum software. What we want to do is we want to be sort of rock stars in this world. Uh, that's the fun, that's the fun bit, and that's what we, we plan to do seriously over the next year and a half. We have a few open projects that I'll discuss that uh, we hope to bring to completions, uh, some of them probably shown for the next QPL. But first, just very briefly, in finance, uh, we've been working on algorithmic trading, boring stuff like computers, making money. I mean, there's nothing interesting about that. Uh, and market analytics, which is a little bit more interesting. It's about understanding how the computers make money and whether you could also make money. Um, the answer is often yes. I mean, computers are not that smart, not yet. Uh, but the slightly more fun part of this work has been developing smart contract uh, programming languages. Uh, mostly for gaming and financial applications, that's been, uh, that's been the focus. That has its own constraints, uh, it brings some challenges, which means that like, uh, programming language design has, has an influence there. Uh, but the, an interesting side effect of this work was that we needed to analyze some relatively complicated causal structures. Because ultimately, the reality of the centralized, uh, the centralized execution is that there is a uh, complicated uh, dependency structure between the different parts of your computation. And being able to handle these kind of structures and understanding the interplay between the computation and the messaging is, uh, was, a, was an interesting challenge, especially doing it in a, a safe, uh, provable, and functional way. And on the quantum software uh, side of things, which is the interesting side of things, I shall reiterate, um, we have three, three main branches. One of them has, has occupied most of our uh, mind power, and the rest is, has been a side effect, uh, or I guess a subcomponent. The main uh, funding interest was really high-level quantum programming. So we imagined a world where people would have to write programs involving hundreds of thousands or millions of qubits. Not necessarily physical qubits that have been compacted into few good logical qubits, but actually thousands of logical qubits and understanding structures that are not necessarily as regular as the quantum Fourier transform. Quantum Fourier transform is a very nice expression. It is highly regular. It's easy to write it in a compact package way. But if you try to imagine what the future of quantum programming will look like in 5, 10, 15 years, uh, maybe 20 if we don't want to be 
optimistic about things. Uh, we will want to have strong types, uh, dependent types. We will want to have certain safe, advanced forms of recursion, and we want to have this in the context of quantum programming, so in a quantum native way, not quantum as a layer under classical computation necessarily. So for the current scenario, maybe the next five years, the real goal is to build tools that can be used to educate uh, people on how to write high-level quantum programs, delegating the optimization, the compilation, the mapping, the uh, error mitigation to people who actually know what they're doing, because that's not something that we know enough about. I will not claim that I am an expert in low-level compilation, because I am not. Uh, none of us is. But the high-level uh, side of things, which is ultimately what I do as a lecturer, trying to teach people who have absolutely no background whatsoever in quantum. They don't know what a complex number is. They don't want to know what a complex number is. The, the imaginary unit to them is, is something mysterious that they don't want to encounter and they will try to stay away from it if possible. You want to teach these people and you have, I don't know, two days, let's say, six hours a day, so 12 hours total, no time to do exercises, no time to do labs, no time to try things at home. They have to get in, learn everything, get out. So you want to do it from the top down. You don't want to start trying to explain to them how uh, matrices work. You don't want to explain to them how unitaries work. You don't want to explain to them how ZX works. That's already too low level for them. It requires sort of a, a different shift. So we need different tools. And part of, this, uh, part of the immediate interest in developing this high level quantum programming uh, tool set is we will use it to start teaching people, hopefully, certainly not, uh, uh, not advanced quantum programming, but at least the gist of quantum programming at least enough that they can go back and say, we have achieved a certain level of quantum preparedness and we can now start to understand what we want to do in our own business, in our own domain of expertise. And then in the midterm, and I say mid, but obviously I mean 10 years maybe, uh, we'll want to have high level actual quantum programming for practical applications in scenarios where you really have a computer with thousands of qubits you want to handle in complicated patterns. Because the reality of trying to implement some of these, uh, let's say, hidden subgroup problem algorithms is that there's a lot of little components that come from algebra, for example. Those, once you start looking into how you optimize them, how you implement them, how they interact, you want to try and understand the relations between different components, how they work together. It's not, it's not quite as simple as uh, writing a, a small pattern and imagining that it scales up. There's sort of some inherent complexity in the fact that you picked a specific group for a specific elliptic curve, for example. So you want high types, you want rich types, and you want them to interact well with your sort of two-dimensional quantum languages. Um, so this is, uh, this is the main overarching goal. And luckily, at least the alpha prototype version of this should be something that we get by the end of the year. Very, very rough, but usable enough that I will not have to teach my next iteration of quantum computing in Oxford without using this, but just using some Python and Qiskit. I, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to teach it the way that it should be taught with graphical methods, with the ZX at multiple levels. So this is, uh, uh, this is the immediate goal, at least uh, for us. But of course, there is a lot more to high level or structured quantum programming than just thinking multi-level compilation or uh, advanced types. There is uh, such a thing as quantum cryptography. It's one of the most promising uh, applications in terms of advantage. And here I really mean device-independent quantum cryptography. So the sort of thing that you get if you have quantum systems that are in some interesting cause of structure with some separation that you can enforce, not necessarily physically, sometimes logically is enough. Uh, and then you get some advantage there. You get some shared randomness that you can generate in different patterns and you have some guarantees uh, as to the uh, security to noise um, relationship. And once you live in a world where you have such networks at scale, and you have people who want to tinker with this and want to use it for practical security purposes, you need ways of analyzing these protocols, not just the one or two or three that are published in papers, but the protocols that people will roll in their own backyards and try to use for their own companies. You want to have some toolkit that allows you to say, OK, this is the protocol that I see. How is it safe? How much of it is safe? Under which conditions is it safe? Or conversely, 
these uh, particular distributions are application dependent. So you want to have tools that tell you, okay, I want to achieve something close to this distribution for my own purposes. I'm not going to tell you what. Uh, give me an algorithm that is safe and achieves it within certain constraints. So this is kind of uh, contract-based discovery, if you will. You're told what it should do, and you go and find a protocol automatically subject to certain constraint. And then interestingly, something that came out of this, uh, of the work that uh, we've been doing with Nicola over the past uh, two and a half years, there is such a thing as contextuality and therefore security in quantum cryptography dependent on the causal structure that you impose on the agents. So there is uh, a certain advantage to finding finer causal structures for certain protocols that enhance their security. We have an example of a protocol that is classically simulatable in one scenario, but it is maximally non-local in a more restrictive causal scenario. So by restricting what the agents can and cannot do, you can actually achieve more security. And there is also a, an aspect of automated discovery there. And a lot of these, I have to say, has already been implemented. Essentially, this large paper that we put out, it's about 474 uh, pages, 270 pages plus appendix, really. Uh, this paper, everything that's in this paper is actually already automated. We have implemented everything. We have a large code base that does all of these analysis already. So that's not going to be, uh, I'm not going to say that that's going to be uh, in alpha by the end of the year. I'm actually going to say that's going to be open source by the end of the year, really, most of it, at least the, the interesting causal analysis stuff. And then there's some additional, uh, some more things we've been doing on, on quantum machine learning, quantum optimization, always also on this uh, sort of contract-based vibe. You tell me what problem you have, I tell you what, a, what an optimized ansatz is for your particular system, or I, you give me an ansatz and I tell you, well, it's probably not going to solve your problem because it has these kind of constraints that come from its structure and we can analyze it. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the extent of, of what I wanted to say. Uh, hopefully short and sweet enough, and we can now go and have drinks and have fun. But thank you very much for your time. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. A couple of times you mentioned this, this causal analysis that's necessary for smart contracts and also in, quant in the quantum case. And, and then you showed us this paper. Is that, the, is that the foundation for the kind of techniques that you're using? Uh -huh. Could is, you say yes. something about it, roughly? Because, I mean, I, you know, I come from a, an event structure background and things like that, so I've got my own kind of axe to, to grind here, I guess. But uh, is it related? Could you say something about it? Uh, so there is, uh, I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. So ah. This paper is going to be presented tomorrow. It just came out. It, okay. Like we put it out a week before the conference, maybe that was, uh, that was about it. So there's a, lot, there's a lot to be said and there's a lot of different examples in it. And I will give a proper description and I will mention the example that, uh, so I will show the example that I mentioned where by restricting the kind of causal structure that you allow, you can achieve a certain higher degree of contextuality. I mean, to an extreme where you go from fully explainable classically to maximally non-local by just changing the kind of signaling that you allow the agents to perform. But it's, um, it is input dependent causal constraints that you need. So you need causal constraints that depend on choices that some of the actors have made, where the choices that the actors make might influence their own past and neighborhood in a certain sense. This is all, it is ultimately all ordered, but the structure is a bit complicated. However, tomorrow I will present an example, but if you're interested in the topology and, and combinatorics underneath, then we can have a, like an extensive conversation. I love to talk about this stuff. It's very exciting. Um, you mentioned 2D programming languages. Um, I'm not sure if it was in the slide, but you were talking about this and yeah. uh, high-level programming. Do you picture that as something that the user is typing or drawing uh, neither is composing is, is how I really picture it. And it's more 3D than 2D, but, uh, there's a uh, layers. Well, then I'm even more confused. Uh, I, uh, how, how, how do I, how do I communicate my, uh, my diagrams to the 
compiler to the system, something like that. Is this is this with is this with code or is this drawing pictures with a mouse? Is this putting on my 3D uh, headset and grabbing things in space and moving them around? What do you think? Well, it's it's not. If you think of drawing pictures with a mouse as in, well, I guess drawing picture with a stylus these days would be slightly more user friendly. I've tried to draw things in, in paint with a mouse and it's, some people are artists and they manage to do excellent things, I can't. Um, there, is, I, there is no plan for things like gesture recognition or augmented reality yet, even though that's something that I would really love to have. Like having a proper like circuit on the topology in 3D where you can go and say, oh, I'm gonna swap these C-notes here, that's great. but. It, I mean, that's not something that a small team can do in a short amount of time. But that's not how, uh, that's not really, that's not user friendly, mm -hmm. drawing it. And typing it in code is kind of against the spirit of having a 2D language, because then you're not really using a 2D language, you're using a 1D language and then imagining that there is some commutation rule that makes it 2D. But there's alternatives to that. Ultimately, all of these categorical diagrams are composed by using building blocks and slotting them together. You don't have to draw the spider. You can place the spider and then connect the spider. And most of it is actually automatable. Like the types of the things that surround it tell you how it should be connected. They even tell you how many legs the spiders have in most cases. So there's, uh, I mean, the burden on the user should be as little as possible because these are not people that are gonna sit there and draw pictures on their screen. Yeah. You shouldn't expect programmers to do that, honestly. Not at large scale, not in a world where we want this to be something that everybody uses without necessarily the artistic, the artistic skills of Dodo throwers um, or the patience of us working with the early generation of, of these tools. Mm -hmm. Up. Yeah, I was wondering if you can explain in more technical terms what high level means, like for, let's say from some like logical or type uh, type system point of view for, uh, for example uh, you know like a classical type system guy would say that okay if i have lambda abstractions or function spaces function types and so on then i'm high level or i have recursive types and do you have you discovered something like this uh, or uh, yeah if you imagine th think of a world where you go from the untyped or type even type lambda calculus all the way up to i don't know idris 2 uh, that's quite a jump in complexity. There are a lot, there, there's a lot of, maybe you could say syntactic sugar, but from a formal point of view, it's not really. You can imagine that there is a high level world and then there is some intermediate compilation or simulated compilation that takes the syntactic sugar and turns it into other stuff in the language and then that turn, gets turned into something lower level, lower level, lower level. So you can imagine these languages as being a stack of richer and richer examples. A lot of the stack already, I mean, a good part of the stack already exists. Like if you go from the basic original ZX calculus to like scalable ZX calculus, I don't know. That's already quite a jumping complexity. Bank boxes are quite a jumping complexity. But there's more complicated uh, yet safe ways of doing recursion uh, or doing pattern matching for 2D languages. There are ways of incorporating advanced classical types. Uh, you want group types, you want cyclotomic numbers, you want uh, sigma types, you want pi types, you want all of this integrated to some extent because it's useful for some of it, but it's also a burden for other parts. Like you don't want it to be a burden to the compiler all in one go. So you need to stratify it. That's sort of, when I think of higher level, I really mean how high in this ideal stratification of languages that they get progressively compiled into each other or co-compiled into each other, do I want to go? And I think quite high if I want to write something like some of the practical HSP algorithms or, and that's not really that complicated, to be fair. I can imagine that in the coming years, we'll want to experiment with even more sophisticated things. Mathematicians take these things for granted, but the reality of programming is that you shouldn't, you should have good types for them. Bob. Yeah, to follow up to the discussion with Alex, like what the most successful mu programming language for music has been like graphical for 25 years. So you just have boxes with certain input output types, you connect them. It's so it's, it's, there's nothing else actually. It's been around for 25 years and probably more. And I should probably say that at Plymouth, uh, our friend Eduardo Miranda has now made an adaptation for that specifically to uh, play music with quantum computers. 
Yeah, so so that, that exists now, a version of Mac specifically to play music on the available quantum computers. And it's graphical, it's graphical. Yeah, to be fair, composers for quantum circuits already kind of, they already exist. Um, they are limited in the sense that they deal with a very, with a very low level language with very simple blocks. Now, you scale that in a bunch of ways, and that's the way that, that I'd imagine people composing this. At least that's the way that the prototypes work. What are concepts of programming? Sorry? What are the concepts of high-level quantum programming? What do you mean by concepts? That's a very broad word. Let's say a classical concept would be iteration. What high-level things do you think high-level quantum programming might be chance to make it quantum? Oh, I see. OK. Well, Can you repeat the, the question? Yes, I will. Um, I, I will repeat it. So what are the, what are the concepts uh, for high-level quantum programming languages uh, akin to iteration for classical programming languages? Something like that? OK. So from a, if you come from the imperative world, uh, then you have things like memory update, iteration, uh, conditions, uh, preconditions, postconditions, contracts. Uh, you have this dynamical view of, of state, state update. That's not quite how I see the quantum side of things. I think of these two-dimensional languages as similar or at least the, uh, an analog of classical functional languages, where you don't actually have, you don't actually have the execution uh, side of things, you have the substitution side of things. So you modify your program, but then again, in classical programming, there's, uh, the running of the program is also done that way. You have a rule that reduces something, and then you continue reducing, you reduce, reduce, until you get some simple term. Now, of course, for quantum programs, that's not how, that's not how it's going to go. You want to write your program, and then your program is going to be, I mean, simplified and simplified and simplified, and then passed to some machine that will have to execute it. But there is still an aspect of which uh, concepts in rewriting of classical programs extend to quantum programs. And anything to do with uh, pattern matching, anything to do with recur typed recursive definitions, anything to do with grammar-based definitions, is, is certainly a very high-level language. If you have complex types, you have function types, some types, dependent types of various kinds, then that is something that you can apply to quite a lot of the components, which, like the dimensionality of your systems, the kind of decompositions that you can allow on your quantum systems, the routing of your quantum systems, that's a group action. I mean, that's a pretty high-level mathematical concept, but it's one that is core to understanding, for example, how you do mapping on real hardware. So all of these things are, they're fairly high level. They're quite, they're quite high up in the hierarchy. I think pattern, sort of grammar-based rewriting and a recursive rewriting, safe recursive writing is, is a pretty useful one. Um, how expressive it is depends on how you phrase it, of course, what the constraints are. Uh, but, but yes, that's, that's the sort of, that's the kind of features that I think about. But I don't think about the execution side of things. I think about the writing the programming side of things. So how do you write this compact efficiently using the minimum amount of information necessary to convey what the program does? Because then, of course, once you have a parameterized piece of code, if your optimizer is insensitive to the parameterization or aware of the parameterization, then you can optimize the parameterized version. I mean, this we already have for things like quantum machine learning. You want the high stuff, yes. Yeah, but if you have now think about the you want to compile, uh, imagine that you have a compiler that is insensitive to some of the types that you use for your systems or some of the repetitions of the blocks in your system, because it's functorial or profunctorial in some way, then you can write a compact version which uses some parametric type and you can compile the parametric block. And then at some point, of course, you will lose that because you will go so low that the type doesn't exist anymore, but for a while you'll be able to keep it, hopefully. And that makes it smaller in terms of, more manageable. I mean, we're human still. I cannot look at a circuit with 4 million gates and understand what it does. That's, I can't. Maybe some people can. I'm going to say I cannot. Good. Great, thank you. Uh, let's thank again Stefano and the seven speakers as well. <laughs>
as well as the, the four companies that I represent because these companies have been the sponsors of the conference. So let's thank Pontinium, Quandela, Huawei, and Hashberg. <laughs>